Thanks for joining us. So Justice Jackson is joining a court that has become a lightning rod for controversy, right? I mean, we're continuing to see some of these cases coming out, even as we speak, um, that that are really changing sort of a, a lot of the landscape, the judicial landscape uh, in this country. So what impact can Judge Jackson have? Well, I mean, as we see in this newly conservative court with six uh, conservative justices and three liberals, she's replacing the liberal Justice Breyer. So it's not going to change the balance of the court. She is going to be a reliable liberal vote, but conservatives are still going to have a pretty strong majority. But that's not to say that she won't have an impact. You know, there's a saying that a new justice makes a new court. Uh, the Chief Justice John Roberts always talked about it being like, you know, you're all gathering with family at Thanksgiving, and then somebody brings. Uh, uh, you know, a new boyfriend or their husband. It changes the dynamics, right? So, so she could really have an impact on those internal dynamics that are actually quite important at the court, uh, perhaps in tempering some of the more conservative justices, uh, maybe uh, helping persuade them not to swing for the fences, you know, because you really only need one or two, or she may not. I mean, she may be a powerful defender who uh, presents a different viewpoint and writes these powerful uh, and defends them and writes these powerful dissents. So there's going to be a big role she will have a big impact, I believe, not only at the court, but on the law. And then it's what she has talked about as a role model uh, for all those young women and girls who, to Ed's point, they've never seen a justice like her. She was the front runner from the beginning, you know, those stellar academic uh, and legal credentials, graduate of Harvard, honors graduate of Harvard and Harvard Law. She clerked for Justice Breyer. Ed said she was a, a, a public defender, the first one ever to be on the Supreme Court. So, you know, she brings a different perspective, but she also has has, you know, rock star credentials uh, to really speak with a strong voice and get the respect of all her colleagues as well. Absolutely. You know, Jan, I wonder um, how are justices preparing to welcome uh, Jackson? Um, you know, at this particular moment, it is such a charged time in our history, and especially uh, given the recent Supreme Court rulings. What kind of environment will she be walking into there? Well, I think it's a really tough mm -hmm. environment right now. I mean, remember, uh, that court is a fortress, and those justices are under incredible, uh, you know, incredibly increased threats. Uh, they have enhanced security. It's a very difficult time inside the Supreme Court right now for the justices. Uh, and so she's coming into a court where everyone already is on edge, not not only because of the divisive, controversial yeah. opinions, but because of security concerns. Yeah. So. Well, we see it's getting ready to begin. But again, they'll have the summer. Uh, she's going to be able—she's going to take two oaths today, as required by the Constitution and federal law. Uh, her bo former boss, uh, Justice Breyer, uh, we see him uh, coming in. He yeah. will deliver one, and the Chief Justice then uh, will, deliv will deliver the other. I guess the Chief Justice will go first. All right. Thank you so much, Jan. I guess we're going to take our viewers now to the Supreme Court and listen in. Brown Jackson to become an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. But before we do so, I would like to recognize Dr. Patrick Jackson, who is here, her husband, and her daughters, Talia uh, and Layla. The um, uh, administration of the oath uh, is required, both by the Constitution uh, and by the Judiciary Act, and so we'll be delivering two oaths. I'll deliver the constitutional oath, uh, and uh, Justice Breyer uh, will administer the um, uh, statutory oath. There will be a formal investiture uh, in the fall, but uh, the oaths will allow Justice uh, Judge Jackson to undertake her duties, and she's been anxious to get to them uh, without any further delay. Are you prepared to take the oath? I am. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Katanji Brown Jackson, do solemnly swear. I, Katanji Brown Jackson, do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely, without that, any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. That I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. 
So help me God. So help me God. Thank you very much. And now I'll turn things over to Justice Breyer. Good. The judicial oath, will you raise your right hand, please? Thank you. I, Ketanji Brown Jackson. I, Ketanji Brown Jackson. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will administer justice. That I will administer justice. Without respect to persons. Without respect to persons. And do equal right. And do equal right. To the poor and to the rich. To the poor and to the rich. And that I will faithfully and impartially. And that I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge and perform. Discharge and perform. All the duties. All the duties. Incumbent upon me. Incumbent upon me. As an associate justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. As an associate justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Under the Constitution. Under the Constitution. And laws of the United States. And laws of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. And now on behalf of all of the members of the court, I am pleased to welcome Justice Jackson to the court and to our common calling. And there you have it. Judge Jackson is now Justice Jackson. You've been watching Chief Justice John Roberts swear in Associate Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court. She is the first black woman to hold a seat on that high court. For more, let's bring back CBS News senior White House and political correspondent Ed O'Keefe and CBS chief legal correspondent Jan Crawford. Uh, so, Jan, let me turn to you first. Remind us why President Biden uh, chose Jackson for this position. You talked about her sterling academic mm -hmm. credentials. She also comes from a very different uh, background in terms of her life experience. She is a mother, a mother who works outside the home. Uh, she also has a law enforcement background with her family. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, she, like I said earlier, I mean, she was the front runner from the beginning because she just checked all the boxes. And of course, President Biden was looking at a lot of highly qualified uh, women in the federal appeals court he could have nominated to the Supreme Court to become the 116th justice uh, on the United States Supreme Court. But she had not only, like we said, those stellar academic and legal credentials, Harvard, Harvard Law with honors, uh, that clerkship on the Supreme Court with Justice Breyer, but she had that compelling life story. You know, the daughter of educators. And as you said, uh, she had members of her family who had been in law enforcement. And, you know, she was a, a kind of a, a rock star in, in high school, too, right? I mean, mm -hmm. in her high school yearbook, if you remember, she wrote that someday she hoped to have a judicial appointment. Mm -hmm. So this is a woman who Amazing. has really kind of had the arc of her life preparing her for this moment, but also that compelling life story where she will bring that perspective. Uh, you know, she's not just someone who kind of grew up in the elite uh, prep school institutions of New York or Washington, D.C., before she went off to the Ivy League. You know, she grew up uh, outside in Miami. I heard, like I said, her parents were teachers. Like, she uh, will come and bring in that more of an everyday person mm -hmm. kind of voice to the Supreme Court that really the only other justice who had kind of that different experience uh, was Justice Clarence Thomas, because he grew up outside of kind of the, you know, the, the, the East Coast, what, I don't even know what we call it, you know, D.C., New York uh, Beltway. I mean, I guess Justice Barrett did as well, so maybe we've got a couple of them now. But she's different. She brings a different voice, and she hopes to use that voice not only in her opinions and with her colleagues and advancing uh, how she believes the law should be interpreted in the Supreme Court as a minority on the Supreme Court in terms of being a liberal, uh, but she can use that voice, as she hopes to do, to inspire others, uh, other young women and uh, girls who may not have seen this as possible, because she has said, you have to see it and then you believe it. Right. Uh, Jan, I just want to follow up on w one point, though. Not just is her background different, her personal background, also her judicial experience is, is different, right? If, if I'm not mistaken, she's the uh, first Supreme Court justice since Thurgood Marshall to have represented indigent criminal clients as a defense attorney. Um, so how will, as a public defender, how will that shape some of her judicial arguments or perspective? 
Right. I mean, she is the first public defender to be a justice. Of course, uh, the late uh, Justice Marshall uh, represented defendants in such a powerful way and worked as a lawyer to really d change the law and advance the cause of justice before he joined the Supreme Court as a justice. Uh, but she did work as that public defender. She also was a trial court judge, which brings different experience. Most recently, she was a federal appeals court judge. That's pretty much the standard route now uh, that uh, justices take with really one or two two exceptions. Uh, you see them coming off the federal appeals courts, which she did uh, here at the D.C. Circuit, sometimes seen as the stepping stone to the Supreme Court, the D.C.-based federal appeals court. And, and now she will join the Supreme Court, bringing somewhat of a different perspective. But in many ways, also, it's not that far out there. You know, she has all their credentials. She has the experience. Different, yes, but also uh, the kind of things that you would yeah. look for uh, if you were, like, casting a, a Supreme Court justice. I mean, she, like I said, she really does uh, check all those boxes. And to your question, uh, to start, and I know I've kind of long wind up here, but that's why President Biden nominated her to the Supreme Court. She kind of checked all the boxes. And, Ed, also, um, we should remind people, this is the fulfillment of a promise that then-candidate Biden made. You know, you covered uh, his candidacy. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Because there was a great deal of pressure uh, on this uh, administration to go ahead and put forth a candidate like Ketanji Brown-Jackson. So it's funny, because it all happened in a CBS debate. Yes. And we were at a reception the night before. Elaine, you may remember this. Yes. It was hosted by the Congressional Black Caucus on, a, on, a, on an old military destroyer that sits there in the waters off of Charleston. Yep. And we're all in one room. And it turns out that then-candidate Joe Biden and Congressman Jim Clyburn of South Carolina were up in another room. And Clyburn says to him at this reception, you want to win this primary? You want to win my endorsement? Here's one thing you can do. You can promise to put a black woman on the Supreme Court. And they go to our debate the next day. And there's a commercial break about halfway through. Clyburn gets up from out of his chair. Various versions of this story have been told. And heads to the back, mm -hmm. catches Biden, and looks at him and says, remember what you said you were going to say. Find a way to say it, whatever it is, in your next answer. And he did. And it was instant news, because mm -hmm. the, yeah. the history was understood. Yes. This would be a big first. But it was also a short-term political move. He understood getting Jim Clyburn's endorsement in South Carolina would be an affirmation from African-American voters that dominate that primary and help him do what he knew he could do, the power. which was win the, Supreme, win the South Carolina primary yeah. and then launch that into Super Tuesday and win the nomination, and it worked. It changed the trajectory it, it really changed of the, the contest yeah. for Joe Biden. The Absolutely. power of that suggestion. Of course, then he was criticized by a lot of uh, folks on the right who claimed that he was being, you know, sort of racially partial when yep. it came to choosing a Supreme Court justice, right? Sure, but, you know, the other argument was... Ronald Reagan had made a similar pledge, and he put Sandra Day O'Connor on as the first mm -hmm. woman. Mm -hmm. uh, it was time to do this. Yeah. Can I ask Jen one question? Yeah, since please. We have her and yes, because... I'm just reading some news that we're getting in. Sorry, I can't see without my glasses. <laughs> uh, but before, don't forget your question. Uh, but let me just say first, we've just gotten from the Supreme Court statements from Justice Jackson and former uh, Justice Breyer. And in her statement, uh, which I'll send to you so we can put it as a graphic, I've just received it, uh, she just says she's truly grateful to be part of the promise of our great nation. She accepts the solemn responsibility of supporting and defending the Constitution without fear or favor. She says she's especially grateful—I guess I can read this—for uh, the time and attention given to me by the Chief Justice and Justice Breyer. It goes on to say he's been a personal mentor and friend of hers for the past two decades. Um, so then we hear from Justice Breyer saying that he's glad for Katanji, using her first name, her hard work, integrity, and intelligence. There you go, Elaine. Uh, there's some of the, the earned her a place on the court. So uh, why he thinks that she's the perfect person for this job. And he's glad for his fellow justices. They gain a colleague who is empathetic, thoughtful, and collegial. Um, so I'll, I'll send this to you so we can continue to show it. But we just got this from the court. And you see in those statements um, kind of just the power of this moment. Uh, Justice Breyer was on the Supreme Court for 28 years, and they have rituals and traditions for how they do 
everything. And But this is really a moment in history where you see uh, one justice leaving, and now this new justice, who happened to be his law clerk uh, back in the day, uh, coming on to take his place. And now next year, next term, that starts in October, she will be on that bench as the justices continue to take up a host of extremely controversial issues. Right. Now, Ed, what and was your question? Well, actually, you, you, you alluded to it. It was that what, what are the traditions and what happens now? Does she literally get keys to the office today? Yeah, Has she, she already get, hired she, her clerks? She literally, I believe that she has or certainly knows who they are, but she literally can get right to work this afternoon. Uh, and you have to have this swearing in. And remember, it's only today at noon that Justice Breyer officially retired. So he's officially retiring at noon today. And then minutes afterward, you saw that ceremony just now in the Supreme Court, where you take those two oaths of office. That, is, that also is required, uh, as the chief indicated, under the Constitution and the, the federal law. And now she's a justice. She can access the computer computer system. Uh, she could, you know, try to figure out what her new office is going to, like, how she might want to decorate it. All of these things now. She's officially uh, the, the 116th justice on the Supreme Court. And, but and she couldn't do any of that before. Like, you know, she couldn't. And that's why they want to do this very quickly. And also, you know, get, that way she can just kind of hit the ground running she'll have all summer. And just because, again, Jan knows all this better than any of us, but uh, it's also important to point out they have not all been together physically for much of this term because of the COVID and now their security restrictions. Would there right. normally be some kind of like a reception or would one of them throw like a backyard picnic to say, hey, congrats <laughs> and welcome aboard? Or what, a what big lunch happen? in the conference room <laughs> and that, you know. Well, I mean, they do it so many different ways. In recent years, this is how we've seen it. It's a little unusual this year, too, because you know, there wasn't a lot of time to plan any of that. Right. You know, we, the court wasn't really sure when the last day was going to be until yesterday. And so then that's when Justice Breyer said, well, then that's when it's official. I'm retiring. And so then, so all of this mm -hmm. happened really quickly. And it's obviously in the interest of now Justice Jackson to get sworn in as quickly as possible. So while years ago, say, the Chief Justice may have taken one of those oaths at the White House, um, they had time to plan for all of that and know when that swearing in was going to be. Today, uh, they wanted to just get it done, of course, with her her husband and her daughters there, and then there will be a, a bigger formal ceremony down the road. But, you know, the justices have—I mean, this is also to Ed's point—the the pandemic changed the way the court right. operates. The public has not been in the courtroom yeah. since uh, or in the court. Uh, outside of kind of just a few Supreme Court regular reporters uh, since, you know, March uh, of 2020. Now, they started uh, sitting on the bench together for arguments. They started having their private conferences again all in person uh, this year. But it's still greatly restricted uh, to members of the public. That post-pandemic world has not completely returned to normal. Uh, Jan Crawford, thank you so much for your expertise. Ed O'Keefe, thank you so much for your expertise and joining us here on Good set to today. You. Really great talking to you guys about this incredibly uh, seismic news. Breaking news. The Supreme Court has given the Biden administration the green light to end the Remain in Mexico immigration policy. It was put in place in 2019 by then-President Donald Trump. It required migrants from certain countries who were trying to enter the U.S. to remain in Mexico while their immigration proceedings played out. The 5-4 decision was made by Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Kavanaugh and, all, Kavanaugh, and all three liberal justices. The ruling is considered a win for the Biden administration and humanitarian groups that have said the policy put migrants in danger. And wrapping up all opinions for the term, the Supreme Court has loosened the regulating power of the Environmental Protection Agency. That's right. The decision says the EPA does not have the authority to set caps on greenhouse gas emissions from power plants. The 6-3 ruling was decided along ideological lines. The ruling is a loss for the Biden administration and will limit its ability to meet his climate goals. CBS News senior national and environmental correspondent Ben Tracy joins us now for more. Hi there, Ben. So how is this going to impact President Biden's plans to fight climate change? Well, Elena, White House spokesperson is saying this is a devastating decision. We should mention, however, this is not the worst case scenario that some environmental groups feared, but it does limit the ability of the EPA to regulate carbon emissions from power plants. And that really will be a big blow to the Biden administration's efforts to combat climate change because they intended to use the EPA to basically force this transition from fossil fuels in the power sector, and that's coal, natural gas.